The tree had yet to bear its fruit for an Aravos that would wear the crown. This was its third attempt. The first Aravos it blossomed in bounty for strayed and faltered, though, not entirely of their own making. The second died in land far away, then laid amid stone beneath the halls of their home, laid to rest away from the tree they loved and that loved them, laid to rest away from the tree that had doomed their fate, or so the tree believes. The second had only been seventeen, and so the tree refused to share its fruit with another. For one hundred and forty-four years did a single apple not grow and fall from its bough, not until the year of 324 before fall, when five of the unifier's blood were born. And for the thirteen years that have passed since that year, the apples have continued to fall throughout the seasons, year after year. Even when a tree should not bear its fruit, still this one continues. None know why, aside from that tree, and perhaps the land beneath where the tree buries its roots. Yet the one the tree blossoms for is not a descendant of its first attempt, nor a descendant of the second. But the third does share the second's name, and not just a name do they share, for also a physicality do they appear near identical to the tree. The second had eyes a deep blue that boasted the twinkling stars of the night sky, but could also appear a dark green if the second wore clothing of different color than that of their royal family. For the third, one day they could appear blue like a cloudless sky, on another it was like staring at the grass that stretched out from around the tree and the pond beside it. The young Aravos preferred it when their eyes were green as the blue brought them expectations that they did not desire, that they felt they could never meet. Expectations the tree perhaps helped create, expectations that the tree did not intend, like the death of the second at so young an age. The tree feared that its fruit had become a curse. All it had taken was the death of one to spark fear into its roots. The young Aravos feared that the name they bore was a curse, and so too did the world around them. For this Aravos was the third of the royal line to bear the name, the previous two all having died young, the third Aravos to be chosen by the tree, and the third Aravos to bear the name. Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more overly sarcastic productions. Decided to come back to miscellaneous myths. This time, Enki and Ninma. Never heard of them. So... We're gonna learn today. Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. And also checked out, mainly check out the Kickstarter link so that uh, you can go and read the prologue and first five chapters of my book. And if you're feeling so generous, you could donate and have, there are like four tiers or four or five. I don't even remember what I put in there. Go check it out. Uh, let's dive in. Pretty much every mythos on the planet has at one point attempted to answer baby's first existential question. Where did we come from? Simple on paper, since the answer is typically your parents. But in practice, that simple question opens up a cascade of other questions of increasingly existential complexity. Where did the parents come from? Where did their parents come from? We can extrapolate pretty simply that somewhere along the line People. there has to have been a first person to be the first parent, so where did they come from? Where did the world come from and what's our place in it? And why are we like this? Why are some people different? It came from God's butthole. Man, I don't know what the fuck. From I'm other saying. people, and what does that mean? And before we knew about evolution, this was a doozy of a conundrum, all right. Plenty of answers have been proposed. Many myths posit that humans were originally created by some benevolent deity, sculpted from clay or wood or other earthly materials. In some other stories, humans instead arise by accident, a collateral consequence from some divine struggle. Pretty much the only consistent theme is that the creation of humanity is usually pretty quick and simple, even glossed over, because from a world building angle, it doesn't really need to be complicated. Once you get a couple humans, you usually get more humans pretty quick, so that's really all we need to explain where the rest of the people come from. Not many stories really feel the need to get that much more detailed. But there are exceptions. Today, let's talk about a Sumerian creation myth that goes into ex- All the way in some- okay. That old one. 
We got a real old myth here. Extreme detail about the creation of humanity and all that that entails. So the story begins shortly after the creation of heaven and earth, and the gods are very busy digging canals, dredging clay, and overall really living that glamorous divine life. Well, except for Enki, primordial god of water, who's been napping in his private water dimension the whole time. Enki's mom, Nama, hears the gods complaining about Enki slacking off and goes to passive-aggressively slap him awake and convince him to do something about it. Enki wakes up, assesses the situation, draws up some blueprints for something that'll be really good at digging canals, and hands them off to Nama, presumably before rolling over and going back to sleep for five more minutes. Nama, with the help of Enki's design and several other gods, sculpts the first humans out of clay and puts them to work doing all that tough canal stuff. Now that they've discovered the art of delegation, the gods relax and hmm. throw a big party. Everyone's super happy with Enki for coming up with this plan, and he's praised for his wisdom and how good he is at deciding everyone's destinies. So Enki parties it up and gets super drunk, and so does his wife Ninma, goddess of mountains and one of the co-creators of humanity. And pretty soon, Enki and Ninma are both super plastered and ready to make some questionable decisions. Ninma's like, listen up, you, you listen. I can do whatever I want, right? I'm a goddess. I can make a dude with whatever fate I want, good or bad. And Enki's like, oh yeah, well anything you can do, I can do something other than that. So like, I can, um, I can make anyone have any fate, no matter what you do. So if you do something bad, I can give him something good. How about that? So Ninma grabs a big sloppy handful of that primordial creation clay and starts making dudes willy-nilly. First up, she makes a dude whose hands don't work, and Enki thinks this dude would actually be a perfect addition to the king's court, since what with this whole hand situation, he won't be able to steal the king's stuff, so he's a perfect candidate for a trusted advisor. Next up, Ninma makes a blind guy, but Enki gives him prodigious musical skill and puts him in the king's court too. Third up is a guy whose feet don't work, and Enki makes him a skilled silversmith and also a courtier to the king. And I'm, I'm not here to sass or judge, but I think Enki might be being a bit uncreative with these good fates. Nin Wait. I'm not here to sass or judge, but I think Enki might be being a bit uncreative with these good fates. Ninma should try making someone with a healthy disrespect for authority. See what Enki does about that. Anyway, fourth yeah. up, she makes a guy whose dong doesn't work, but Enki dumps a load of magic water over him, which fixes that up real nice. Apparently, Okay. Weenus doesn't work disease is caused by minor demonic possession. The more you know. Then Ninma mixes things up a bit and makes an infertile woman. Enki makes her a skilled weaver and puts her in the harem of the queen. Please note, this is your reminder that harem literally just means women's quarters of the household, a private space where the women and prepubescent men of the family, specifically the royal family, could hang out in a modest and protected area, often guarded by eunuchs. It, originally, it, rid it originated in Mesopotamia, hence its use in this myth, and was later adopted into the Islamic world. The sexualized interpretation popular today was the result of salacious European dudes who concluded the only reason Muslim women would stay in a private room they weren't allowed into was if they were saving all that hot exotic loving for their male masters. In practice, it was simply considered socially inappropriate for women to interact with men outside their own husbands and families. Though this was limited somewhat by practicality, as many working class women held jobs that put them in contact with the public in general, this also created a space of jobs that needed women to do them for decency reasons, as any situation that involved women's needs would be naturally forbidden to men. The harem was a sign of social status and privilege, I was as, as it was indicated that the family was well off enough that the women did not need to work. As a result, women in a harem were often of high social status and politically powerful. Thank you. Moving on. Finally, Ninma creates an intersex person who Enki, you guessed it, places in the king's court in some kind of position of honor. The text is both unclear and physically broken in places, so hey, we're doing our best. Side note, this king better be a good boss or Enki's gonna be real disappointed. So, Ninma's mm. pretty pissed, but Enki's not done yet. He takes the last of the clay and creates a very, very busted up dude named Umul. Umul is what is medically classified as a hot mess with basically no functional organs. Ninma He's just like me. Ninma tries to talk to him, but Umil is too messed up to understand her, and Ninma is very frustrated, accusing Enki of making someone neither alive nor dead. Since Ninma fails to find a way to counterbalance Umil's messed up fate, while Enki was able to guarantee good lives for all her creations, Ninma loses the competition, and Enki is praised as the highest, coolest god around. And so is his dick, for some reason. Thanks, Mesopotamia. Anything you can do. Okay, this I myth can... is sometimes cited as just a, just a, as a just-so story explaining the existence of disabled people, which is technically one way to interpret it, but I'm not a fan because it is a bit dismissive. Better, I prefer I... the less casually insulting interpretation, e.g. that this myth explains that everyone has a place in the world they can thrive regardless of disability, and it's just a matter of finding that place. Anything. For the life of me, I cannot remember which, why I put a fish on Enki's head, but I cannot change the, his design now, so better here we are. You. And that was Miscellaneous Myths, Enki, and Ninma. I have nothing to add here at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.